Today we're going over the publisher room on TryHackMe. Let's read the description. This machine is a simulated environment hosting some services. Through a series of enumeration techniques, including directory fuzzing and version detection, a vulnerability is discovered, allowing remote code execution or RCE. Attempts to escalate privileges using a custom binary are hindered by restricted access to critical files and directories, necessitating a deeper exploration into the system security's profile to ultimately exploit a loophole that enables the execution of unconfirmed bash shell and achieve privilege escalation. So we've got our user flag to focus on first and then our root flag hopping over into our VM. I've gone ahead and created our directory. I've already gone ahead and run auto recon against our IP. So if we look at our results, so first we've got our SSH running on port 22 and then we've got our HTTP running on port 80. So let's start off by looking in our results in our TCP 22 SSH map TXT file. We can identify the box is running open SSH version 8.2 and we can see it's running on Ubuntu. Scrolling through our SSH report, there's nothing that's jumping out. So let's go ahead and look at our port 80 that we had. So this ran curl, Ferox Buster, Nikdo and Nmap. So let's start there. So we can see Apache is the service running using HTTP. We can see a version number. Here in our title, uh, we're starting to understand uh, what this service is hosting. So some sort of publisher, blog maybe, some site running SPIP insights and tips. So it's about this SPIP, SPIP, whatever that is. Uh, one of the modules um, from HTTP internal IP disclosure, we've got an internal IP leaked here. So also some other scripts that were run like WordPress enumeration, not getting anything there. Got a sitemap generator, uh, the root directory, we've seen an images directory. We can see some HTTP methods that we could maybe play around with, trying to identify some sort of framework or um, content management system. So something like WordPress, which it hasn't identified. So it's trying to find anything else. So we might just have like a bare bones, like a static site, just HTML and CSS. Uh, so let's go ahead and navigate to our port 80 running on this system. So we can see the front page in its full glory. Now hovering over pretty much any link in here, these are all just tags. So they're just fake links. They're not going anywhere. So it kind of is telling me that like, we're not gonna just be able to click around, see all different pages. These links are actually going to a real website called spip.net. That's telling me this SPIP is a real thing. So SPIP is a publishing system for the internet in which great importance is attached to collaborative working, to multilingual environments and to simplicity of use for web authors. Free software, GPL license, anyone can use it, community run and developed. Getting a sense uh, this person has used this system, this software, and they've made a, a community magazine all about it. This is kind of cluing me in to need to figure out more about this SPIP. Maybe we can find a version because if we go back to our description, we are looking for some version, but we haven't done any further directory fuzzing. So far, all we have is this images directory and it lists out our images. Let's go back to our scan results and check out our Ferox Buster Der Buster. So in here, we can see that images directory again, all those images that we just saw, index.html that we were on. Something we haven't seen is this spip directory, which has a PHP file running. And we've got some local cache. So that must be a part of spip, I'm assuming. So let's go over to spip. It looks like this is the actual service or program running that HTML site was kind of talking about. We've kind of found where it lives. So these cache files are kind of interesting and we can see that there is a subdirectory local. So let's head over to local, see if we can maybe see any other files 
and get any other information. Uh, I'm not logged in, I don't have any authorization, but uh, I'm seeing some important files. Config, configuration.txt. Uh, this is showing what I'm assuming is dependencies, like other programs that this S pip uses and I'm assuming in these brackets are the versions that it needs to run and spip itself has got what I assume is the version running 4.2.0 cool so I think I've got enough now of what's running on the system looks like I have a possible version number through um, that fuzzing. So let's go ahead and use a program like searchploit to find a possible exploit. So now with this enumeration, we're trying to figure out, is there already an exploit for this version of this software? So we can go ahead and search the command line for this program and specifically that version number that we've already found. And what do you know, we've got a remote code execution, an RCE, which lines up with our description. So we can go ahead and copy that number. So what we can do is use the X tack or switch to look at this exploit in a little bit more detail. So here we've got the SVE that we can further Google and research a bit more. We can see that it got a 9.8, it's critical, not good for the system, but great for us. And we can see here before 4.2.1, so the system that we're looking at, form values in the public area were vulnerable to RCE because serialization is mishandled. So if we kind of look up programming serialization being mishandled, uh, serialization is a process of converting an object or a data structure into a format that can be stored or transmitted, such as a stream of bytes. But when this is mishandled, it can lead to issues and problems like we're seeing. It's a security risk uh, along other things like data loss and incompatibility. So we can also go ahead and grab this CVE and we can go ahead and find the NIST govs site. We can go ahead and find other references for this vulnerability. If we go over to packetstormsecurity.com, here it actually details that there's a Metasploit module that exploits this PHP code injection. So this is a great option if you prefer using Metasploit, which I do. So let's go ahead and start up MSF console-q for quiet. And then we wanna go ahead and search for our RCE forum. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use one cause that is number that it's listed as. Then we can go ahead and look at our options, set our R hosts, which is the system that we're targeting. And we don't need to specify our R port because it's already on 80, but we will need to specify the target URI, which isn't in the root directory. We know that it's in the SPIP directory. So set R hosts here, set target URI to SPIP. And then we just need to set our listener host, which is going to be our IP on the VM. So if you ever need it, we can just go ahead and run ifconfig and we're using our ton zero, our tunnel to the try hack me VPN. So we can go ahead and copy that. So set L host, paste that in, and we'll just leave our port as 444. And there we can go ahead, type run, Give it a few seconds and we should get our interpreter shell. So we can go ahead and use sysinfo and we can see here now we're on that remote Ubuntu system and it used PHP Linux to get this interpreter shell. Go ahead and ls and we're gonna see the web directory that we've now gained unauthorized initial access through this remote code execution. So we can go ahead and drop a shell on the system from interpreter and then we can type in who am I? And we can see we've logged in as the www data user, which is running that service that we took advantage of. So that makes sense. We can print the working directory and it looks like we're inside the home because any created user gets a directory created in home. So we can type exit to get back to interpreter and we can kind of flick between the two, but we can start kind of looking around and getting an understanding of what's on the system. Maybe like cut out the HTTP access. Maybe we can find some credentials somewhere. But without going too deeper into SPIP, because I feel like it may have served its purpose for this room. Let's see if we can go ahead and get that user flag and 
dive deeper into perhaps the next step. So we can CD up and look at what's this parent directory. Here we can see that index.html that we were first looking at that's on the front of port 80. So we can go up again. So now being in this think user, assuming that this is a user on the system, we can ls and we can go ahead and see we do have this user.txt, which is great. And looking at the permissions, everybody has read access. So I should just be able to cat out this user txt file. Copy that and paste it into try hack me. Great, so now we have that initial flag on the system. So let's start thinking about how we can possibly log in as another user to get a better shell. So if we wanna confirm if that think user is in fact a user, we can go ahead and look at the Etsy password file. This last entry, we've got this think user. So it definitely confirms that we can perhaps log in as that user. While we're here, we can see and confirm that that is the home directory and we can see the login shell being bin sh. So not bash, but just sh. Cool, so looking again at this user uh, a bit more closely, we did see a particularly interesting directory being the hidden ssh directory. So let's definitely go in there and perhaps we can see a public private key and it looks like we've got the public ID RSA key and we have a private key in here. So using Meterpreter, we can just go ahead and download that RD RSA and that'll go back to wherever we had our startup shell. Um, so we can see here, we started up the shell in this publisher, just go back, we've now got this RD RSA there. If we just go ahead and look at our permissions, these are not gonna work if we actually wanna try and use this. But let's go ahead and change mod uh, 600, which will give the correct permissions, uh, which is as follows. So this is gonna allow us to try an SSH in as this think user, which we confirmed is a user on the system, to the system IP, and we can go ahead and pass through an identification, in this case, this key. Great, we can go ahead and say yes. Awesome, and now we're logged in. So before we kind of go any further, got a SSH login, which is great as a user on the system. So this is all working out well. We have a banner from SSH that's kind of given us some extra information. So we can see here like the RAM, the amount of RAM or memory that's being used. Are the processors running on the machine. And here we can even see and confirm that we're running Docker. Now that we're on the system, we're not trying to enumerate from the outside. We're trying to enumerate from the inside, so to speak. And we can see, yeah, there is, there's Docker. So maybe that's an avenue to gain further access or privileges on the system. So now we're logged in. Where are we? Who are we? So we're kind of back where we just were, but now we're logged in as an actual system. We can try things like sudo tac l to see what we can run with escalated privileges, but we don't know the user password for think. Uh, so that's not really going to get us anywhere. Maybe there are some credentials hidden around and we kind of have to go through all of this uh, file path to maybe find something like that. Another option is we can look at our environment. Environment is to run a program in a modified environment, we're gonna see some environment variables. So if we scroll to the top, our shell environment variable, which is the shell that we're currently using, is a little unusual. We don't have bash, which is kind of typical, or sh like we saw back when we were looking at the Etsy password. Instead, we have this ash shell. We are in a different shell, a custom shell of some sort. Um, so that's a bit unusual. So another way is to echo out that environment variable. And we can again see that strange shell that we're currently in. We kind of want to get to a regular shell. That would probably be our next course of action because what's kind of strange about this shell or this current setup is we don't have write permission. Our home directory is supposed to be ours and we can't even write to it. So if I just want to touch a file, create something, we can't do that here. And if we go over to temporary and we try and touch like a file there or just create a file there, we can't, which is super unusual. Everybody should be able to make something in the temporary 
directory. So let's find a directory that we can write to. Uh, using the find command, uh, we wanna find something in the root directory. Uh, we're looking for a directory and we wanna make sure it's for this currently logged in user. And we wanna pass through this writable tag. And any errors, let's just go ahead and get rid of them and go have a look. It's unusual um, because think comes up. So this is not a perfect command. If you have any suggestions of a better command, please tell me. But we do get this run user 1000. I'm not totally sure what this directory is. This 1000 makes me think it's like the ID of our user. So it has something to do with us. But if we go ahead and look at the permissions, we can see we do own this and we do have write ability. So what we can do is CD over into this directory we can write and we can go ahead and copy over linpeas. So on our local system, we can go ahead and locate linpeas. Uh, we're gonna be looking for our shell version. So we can just CD over there and set up a Python server. And then here on our remote system, we can just go ahead and use a command like wget and we can go ahead and get that from our system where we just spun up that server. So this we want linbees.sh and since we're in a directory we can write to, it'll put that there. We just want to be able to execute our linpeas, go ahead and give it the ability to do so. And then we can go ahead and execute it just like so. Once linpeas runs, we can go ahead and take our time, go through it and find any interesting files that we may have missed. This really just helps this uh, enumeration step that we're at. So definitely take your time and go through this line by line. What stood out to me was this unexpected OPT directory. Here we have a Docker file that we can read and look at, but we also have this owned by root file called runcontainer.sh, which everybody has read write access to. Super unusual. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. So if we try and CD into OPT and list that out, we don't have permissions to look at that directory, but we know what's in here. So if we cat that out, we can go ahead and see this file. So this file got me thinking, um, perhaps there's a way to actually execute it. So another thing that we can do is look for SUIDs or files that can be run by other users. And when we go ahead and look for those permissions, uh, we can actually see an unusual run container in the S bin. So here is this run container command that is what we can assume using this shell script. And we can actually confirm that if we go ahead and run strings against this run container binary. If we look at the user in S bin where it's located and inside the strings um, that uh, the command can pull out is we've C bin bash and then we see that shell script that we were just looking at. So we can run this container shell script and we can read it. So this is really unusual. This is definitely going in the right access to uh, try and get out of this funky shell that we're in. So now we have somewhere we can copy bin bash to. Let's go ahead and put it there. And if we list out what's in bash and see it did work. Fantastic. Go into our bash shell that we did copy over. And then we can CD into this OPT directory and then since now we're in a subshell, we can go ahead and edit this run container shell. And in here, we can go ahead and make an edit. And now we have permissions because we're in this subshell. So what we want to go ahead and do, since this is running shell as root, we can essentially do anything. We want to go ahead and get this bash shell and go ahead and put it somewhere where we will have permissions because it's running as root. And then we just want to go ahead and give the S bit to this bash file so we can go ahead and escalate privileges. Let's go ahead and save that off. So now if we look at temporary, there's nothing there. But if we go ahead and use run container, control C, because we don't actually want to go through with the whole program. And now if we list out our temporary, we can see this copied bash. And if we look at that bash that we created, it's executable via root. So let's go ahead and execute that. 
Um, if we go ahead and do that, just without any flags, uh, it won't work. Instead, we run this with the dash P, there it'll execute as root and we can actually go ahead and get that privilege escalation. So we can go over to root, we can list out our directory there and we go ahead and cat this root.txt. Awesome. We can paste that in and there is our room completed. Publisher is done and dusted. On the screen, you can go check out Python Olama, reading local files and using AI on your system. Okay, bye.